I'm just posting the question oh. again. Uh, please reply to the chat. Okay, I think a decent audience has joined. So, so I am just going to start this session. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Adarshom Panigrahi, a member of the Student Placement Council, and I welcome you all to this IIC Industry Interaction Cell conducted session call called Masters in Data Science at US. This is the part of a higher education series conducted by IIC. So I would like to introduce our guest speaker for this session, Mr. Shashwat Kakkar. He is a IITMB student who is also a dynamic data scientist with a solid background in electronics and instrumentation engineering and three years of industry experience as a data scientist. He completed his uh, undergrad studies from Bits Pilani and after being a research associate at a TIFR, which led to his passion in data science, uh, he finally completed a diploma from IITM uh, BS program. And now he has successfully uh, secured admissions at Northwestern University, USA. So I will now request Mr. Saswat to share his experience and insights on how to navigate the process of obtaining a master's degree in a foreign country like US. So yeah, Mr. Sashwat. Thank you, Adarsham, for the lovely introduction. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, and as I see that a lot of you, so people are putting in their options, and I see you are ready to explore. And that is, I'm glad I will be able to help you in whatever way to help you understand what is the application process, and if you aim to go for a master's in data science and US. So a little bit about myself, as Adarshan just pointed out, so I've done my undergrad from Bits Pilani and I joined the IIT Madras program back in 2021, Jan 2021, that I was in the first batch. I completed the foundation levels and I have now exit. I was exited with both the diplomas in programming and data science uh, in 2023, December 2023. And then I started, I was, I started applying to all the universities last year, and I have currently accepted an admit from the Northwestern University, which I will be attending uh, coming this September. So for this session, there are 10 items that I have kind of uh, decided to share with you. One is what are the, what were the diff, uh, two tests that I had given? What were my number of admits and rejects to give you a overall uh, view of how it can also go for you with some tips on how many universities you should be applying to and what categories do universities generally fall under. Then I'll just be sharing a general timeline an ideal timeline that you should be following, but it's not a hard and fast rule. Then I'll be going through the university selection and shortlisting process. This is your initial step when you are deciding that you do want to do a master's and masters doing masters in US is a significant investment. So you should always, uh, kind of take all the, the necessary actions and choose the right university for yourself and how you should go about it. I'll be sharing that. Then there are certain educational documents which are generally required in all the application processes whenever you apply to any program. Then main part comes of letter of recommendations. Generally universities require around three LORs. So I'll be sharing in detail how you should go about requesting an LOR from any academic or professional connection that you have. Then we'll, we'll be going through the statement of purpose, uh, or it is also sometimes called as personal statement. And resume nowadays has, has gained importance in application process. So it is like you're applying for a job. So you give your, you provide an up-to-date resume with giving a brief overview of what were your academics, what were the projects you have done in a curriculum or even in work or internship experience and additional essays. And then finally, the last three steps, which are main is that when you start applying to universities, what are I'll be sharing certain key pointers, what you should be keeping in mind. Then once you get an admit, what should be generally, what steps you should generally take. And then finally the visa application. So let us start. So I gave two tests. First is the GRE test and then the TOEFL test. GRE is generally given for master's program. There is also another exam called GMAT, but that is generally required for business focused programs like MBA. 
or MBA and also nowadays business analytics where they do accept GMAT scores. But generally the preference for any master's program is GRE and the exam during that exam, I scored a 321 score out of 3 to 40 and the ideal score that you should aim for is a minimum of 310 nowadays and you should be also main focus should be on quants that is quantitative uh, aim to score above 160 because quant score has higher weightage uh, generally that is what has been observed by like this was shared by peers and alumni and uh, have a good decent score in verbal and also analytics is basically the A that stands for analytics. It's mainly a kind of a reasoning essay that you have to write on a random prompt that you get during the exam. It's mainly again English checking only. So and uh, the resource that I used for my preparation was gregmat.com. So this is a really nice uh, website uh, who where for very low price of around $5 at that time uh, when I gave the exam last year, it was $5 a month. You do get a very proper study plan as well as the main suggestion that the tutor who is a, a, who's the owner of this website, he teaches mainly focuses on GRE. He gives you a good study plan as well as he tells that only to use official GRE book and test series that is sufficient for preparation for GRE exam. And likewise for TOEFL also, it was just a two week study that I needed to do for English and I scored a very nice score of 114. So this is a general suggestion from my side is that always uh, try to take the GRE and TOEFL in one go, in one attempt and clear it in one attempt because it is a significant investment from your side. It does co cost quite about amount of money around 50K both the tests combined. So I would always recommend to students that once you start your preparations, give these exams, prepare for these, these exams thoroughly and give them at one go. No, and not to try for multiple attempts because universities also do have preference for first time takers with a good score. And not for, so it's like uh, the competitive exams that we have in India. And coming to my university admits, I applied to eight universities uh, and these were the admits and rejects uh, distinction you can see uh, where I mainly focused, I got, I accepted admit mainly from Northwestern University. I received from others from like USC, Vanderbilt, Georgetown and Northeastern and others were the three like UC San Diego, uh, Georgia Tech and Carnegie Mellon were the rejects. And I'll be also coming to the part of where the university shortlisting will, I'll share that there are mainly four categories where you that you should keep in mind. Uh, one is super ambitious, then is ambitious, moderate, and safe. So these, is the, these are the general categories that you should be kind of dividing uh, your uh, shortlist in when you plan to apply. Next, I'll be... Next, so this is the general timeline. Uh, that is the ideal timeline. If you go online, this is kind of a general go to uh, go to kind of this breakdown of how you should be approaching while ap applying for the master's program. And if I just wanted to also check the chat, uh, Adarsham, if you can just help me with that, how many people, if anyone has added And if you guys can also put in chat so that accordingly, I can also uh, kind of change my pitch and share in depth of to understand that if you have already started applying, then what are the certain things that you should take okay, care of? And accordingly, you can also. Yeah. Most students currently have applied with E, but a student uh, named Shrusti has uh, uh, replied B, which is uh, fall 2025. Okay. Awesome. So. There are a few well, okay, test is pending, okay. But you have decided that you want to go in fall 2025. Okay, great. So then I will go to the next slide. So this is a very general approach, but uh, believe me, it's not that this is not a hard and fast rule that you need to be starting your journey nine months before. If you still have not given the GRE TOEFL, 
and are planning to go for fall 2025, I would highly recommend that you start preparing for the GRE and TOEFL and give them in the coming months, one, two months timeline so that you are well prepared for, you know, drafting your SOPs, reaching out for LORs and vacation deadlines. Okay. Uh, uh, next slide. Yeah. So first part is where you kind of select the university that you will be interested in applying to. And these are certain questions that I have kind of noted down that which will help you kind of ask that, you know, which course program. So like generally it is recommended that you select one stream. So for example, I've gone for data science, but then there are also certain programs where they only focus on data engineering or data analytics or business analytics as for fact, which are the upcoming new programs that are catching attention of uh, recruiters as well as other universities where they're bringing in these new programs. Then also your test scores uh, that universities have certain test score preferences. So this has been observed in uh, TOEFL, your English proficiency test that most of the universities accept TOEFL uh, in US. IELTS is a more of a global approach if you are also planning to apply to UK and other European countries, but TOEFL is the go-to test for applying to US universities. And there's also a new test that is come up of is the Duolingo aptitude test DET, uh, but I do not have much information because it's a new test, but general preference still is uh, TOEFL. And then also you want to see that what is your current CGPA? What is your target budget? Your preferred location or weather? So do you want to only for, uh, do you prefer cold? Are you fine with cold? uh weathers or you only want to go to places like which have a similar climate as of for example mumbai or even bangalore for example uh so california would be uh the, a state that would come to your mind and also course duration are you willing to study for one year or two year and also best would be always to ask your seniors or alumni from your university who have went to us they can recommend you certain universities so always uh, you always should start with a long wish list. No need to worry about having only eight to 10 universities in your list from beginning. It is better to strike out universities and go through this cycle two to three times. So that is why I'm suggesting, I would suggest that you go through the rankings, YouTube video recommendations, your senior alumni recommendations. Create that long wish list of universities, potential universities you think you you will be able to you know crack or apply and get an uh, get an admit and once you go through that process bring it down to 12 to 15 universities once you have reached that comfortable zone where you are confident that i think that i'll be able to you know apply to these universities and i think i have a good chance of getting an admit then i would recommend to do a final drill down where, where you go through the process see whether what is the requirement in terms of SOP, a number of LORs, even the test, like what is the requirement for GRE? Is GRE waived or not? Suppose you are not planning to take GRE, then if there is a university in which application they require a compulsory GRE score, then you may want to uh, not consider applying there because any all the requirements that are given in any application page of that university, whether it is written preferred or even required, uh, you should be sure that if you even miss one point from there, your chances of admit will go drastically down. So that way you can see, um, like for example, test, if there's a TOEFL is preference, then you may want to see that are there other universities that accept DET, for example, Duolingo, then accordingly uh, finalize your uh, list of, you know, six to 10 universities. That is a ideal a practical number of universities that you should be applying because each application requires its own dedicated amount of time because every application will be differing. Certain universities may have additional essays and there may be even different deadlines. So
oftentimes university have a priority deadline and a uh, regulars like us also to apply in priority deadline so that you have higher chances of us uh, getting an admit and this was what i was talking about the four categories super ambitious ambitious moderate and safe so this is gen i just provided a, a general breakdown of how you can go ahead this is not a hard and fast rule but you know super ambitious generally one to two ambitious two to three universities you can target moderate uh, two to three and safe where you feel that if, if you apply you are definite that you will get an admit and you are also fine with attending that university links which are provided here i also paste them in the chat during the q and a so uh, north carolina state university ncsu they have provided very two great good resources uh if you are you know confused that you don't know what universities are providing what kind of data related courses or degrees they have provided a detailed list according to the year in which that program started and in which a, in which state of us so it, they have provided an interactive map and also the list of all the universities you can go check it out and also the data science job index the current job index in us so you will also be able to see uh, you know for example what are the hot spots for data related jobs one common uh, the most famous location is san jose for example in california where most of it is a high concentration of data science related jobs you also have chicago you also have washington dc for example so that way this these two links will uh, help you get a head start and you know create your own custom shortlist so i'll go to the next slide friends i'll not be repeating everything but this is the general get go of what are all, what all documents you generally need to submit in each and every application you submit to a university uh, it is important to have a proof of degree with you available uh, generally after you apply if you get admitted you need to have you need to have it handy to uh, you know kind of submit it to the admissions team and valid pass passport a passport valid passport is absolutely essential to apply to any university do not have an expired passport if you do not if you have expired passport i will recommend that you start your process of passport renewal and then apply to universities have a resume draft resume ready while you are applying it will uh, you know going to this process of shortlisting uh getting the sop and lor keep resume for the end because having an internship then i would recommend that you add a point so that in the end you have a up to date resume when you are uh you know kind of applying to the university at or let's say a suppose deadline so and statement of purpose it is required letter of recommendation thumb rule is 3 that is generally what universities require and in that if you have work experience of um uh, you know 2 to 3 years then i will recommend having at least one professional lor and two academic or even two professional lors are fine and one academic if you have three more than you uh, know more than 3 years of experience like i had and if you have only 0 to 1 years of experience then the thumb rule is that you should have all three of them academic if you have an internship experience you can convert it okay, you can have one as professional and two as academic but generally for uh, students who are who are planning to go directly after undergrad all three should be academic lors that is generally recommended and gre score just one the uh, one question uh, so generally three required right uh, so if it is academic uh, so will the three will be given in the same college or same academic or uh, the three must should be others like no, no. Uh, so, if it work uh, so yeah. for uh, so i will i will come to that point later also but yeah to answer your question uh, academic it can be any professor from any university with whom you have worked 
with whom you have worked okay. i'm repeating this because people tend to go for you know generic uh, lors where they have attended a class with some professor and you got a decent grade but what the uh, admission team of any university will want to look is for the repo that you have with that professor on a personal level that they are recommending you because of your skill sets and not just because of being a student in their uh, program. I'll just give example of myself also that I took one LOR from even IIT Madras faculty where, where I was working in a project closely. So that way you can create your own PNC. Uh, so I hope this helps to answer. Yeah, questions. I understood. Uh, oh, yeah. no, another question. Uh, so I should um, can, get, uh, can, I'm proceeding. Can we yeah. take the questions in the end? So that yeah, you sure. know, every even. Yeah. The yeah. Sure. Will, okay. Will be answered after the presentation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, so, GRE score report. Sometimes university have a self declaration. Uh, so you can also declare and no need to you know submit via ETS because every time you have to. Uh, submit and transcript via ETS, there is a payment involved, of course, with that. So they want to make sure that students are not burdened with, you know, additional, uh, you know, investment on top of the application fee. And application fees also sometimes are waived off. So always keep a look out, look out for, you know, emails from the university teams where certain times after certain period they may you know wave off like this last application fee for certain programs and also what kind of TOEFL score whatever uh, English proficiency test uh, that, that the university requires now there is also added a point that you can show the proof of your bachelor's degree or any additional program like for example IIT Madras if you're doing more than one degree you can show the proof that both the degrees that you have taken are solely taught in English. And that is the, the that sentence or that proof is generally present in your transcripts. So if you submit your transcript, that is a, a proof submission from your side that you are proficient in English and you may not require to even uh, submit the TOEFL. But still, I would recommend take the TOEFL score based on the university that you decide you apply, you may want to apply to because if you're also not taking the TOEFL score, then you uh, you may have limited choices in terms of university because still universities do require TOEFL. Most of the universities in US require a TOEFL score. So now coming to the letter of recommendation. So this is the professional part where I'm, if you are kind, kind of currently working professional, then these are the few pointers that you should keep in mind uh, while you know requesting your recommender that what points they should be having in their letter, which is generally uh, you know around let's say 300 to 600 words a letter. And they just, so these are certain points that I have put from my side that you can you know, discuss with your uh, manager or whatever, a peer with whom you have worked closely in the company so that they have a good idea of what all points they should be keeping in their letter so that it's not generic and uh, it does not you know lower your chances of getting an admit it should be very personalized uh, letter of recommendation and that is why like you know provide detailed uh, you know detailed description of you know one to two major projects that you have delivered with or under their mentorship if they are in a senior position and also mainly focusing on your specific contributions, not as a whole as a team, but your individual contribution is main to highlight the technology stack you have used mainly in, you know, data related or computer science master's degree. It is important that the, that the recommender is able to highlight that you are also proficient in certain tech uh, tech skills that they are looking for. And also, if you have taken any research under them and your skill sets in general, and also it's more of like, a, if you see in interviews now, uh, we have that star method. What was the situation? What was the task? What do you kind of accomplish? And what is the result? So challenges, if you, have, if you face, then they will be able to share that, how you as a team player came up with the innovative solution. So I'm just giving a general idea. 
So that way, make sure to customize work with your recommender and do not keep it to them to the uh, to you know just kind of have a to and fro with them so that they also have a proper framework and they are able to you know create a good LOR for you and which will create a good impression in addition to your SOP which is your personal document where you are putting forth your reasons why you want to specifically study in this university which I'll be coming to to in the slide and similarly uh, academics if you are undergrad it will mainly be your professor or even a research uh, phd research student maybe if with whom you have worked or if you were at ta or ra in a particular uh, course then professor should generally be able to share the details of what uh, you know subjects that they have taught kind of a general introduction and also where all where you contributing specifically um, you know while working with them and option I have put that, you know, uh, in professional ad, I have suggested that you also put any CSR team buildings that you have contributed in the company and what are the responsibilities you have done. And do not share, do not share your hobbies. Do not make them share your hobbies because it becomes a third person narrative. So don't ask them to, you know, what you are good at playing football and you're part of the football team of the company. That does not add much of a value. But let's say you won a trophy with that team, then you may want your manager or your professional peer to share that in a subtle way. And similarly for academic, if you are part of, let's say club, just being part of a club does not put much of a, you know, added weightage. So better to stick with only the academics. But if you have part been part of, let's say some important committee, where you were a board member and not a just a general team member, you had certain responsibilities, then you may ask your professors to highlight that in their LOR and share that because that gives a additional bonus point of uh, them being aware of your soft skills. And this looks good uh, to the admissions uh, team that go through the LORs. Statement of purpose. This is the main document, um, which will kind of many a times can also be a deciding factor for your admit or reject. Statement of purpose, it's uh, always recommended to have a common draft. Let's say you have finalized your universities uh, 7 to 10, 6 to 10, whatever number. Create a common draft. Have a Keep a word limit for yourself of 1,000 words. In your first draft, you start, you know, certain uh, what are your goals, short term and long term your why you want to basically study data science or computer science, let's say, whatever, why you are interested in that particular field, what was, what event led you to, you know, what triggered you to, you know, go further for masters. Describe your academic background, what any kind of certifications that you did in addition to your academics that has prompted you to you know, also be interested in advancing your skill sets further by taking a master's program. What was your performance in academics? And certain details of you know, very important projects or work projects that you took uh, during your uh, professional or internship. And the second point, the next point would be mainly if you have any uh, freelance projects or even whatever projects that you have where you feel that it connects with your master's program and your skill sets that is important because it it needs to it has to feel like a story if um that is what i would be in one line it would it should feel like a story that you are introducing yourself what your goals are why you are interested then giving certain a little detail about your academics then what projects you took which actually connect with your masters and also connect back to your, uh, uh, you know, your goals and then any extracurricular activities that you took so that you can highlight the soft skills also that you have, you know, team building you have done. So, or you have leadership skills in you. And then comes your university specific paragraph. This is where you will be customizing it according to each and every diff, uh, university you apply to. So that is where you kind of, uh, you know, focus on 
what courses in the program curriculum you are interested which faculty you want to work with let's say being a TARA uh, during the master's program if there is any ongoing projects that interest you then you can also share that uh, and in master's program in the US generally there are student led events and they have detailed information just like in IIT we have Kaziranga club, different clubs you can specify what clubs you are you know you have been part of and you know connect the dot and say that oh i am also interested to you know be part of this student club that you have in your program and i feel that this will all i would like to continue what i have been doing before and always be optimistic and conclude your sop by sharing your positive attributes your positive what makes you unique so in two to three lines share why the admission committee should consider you as a prospective student and give you the admin why you deserve that seat so these are the general pointers for the statement of purpose and what i have seen during my applications is that um sops there is no you know general uh you know a uh, common word limit every university has their own unique way of you know, giving the SOP statement to the student. So uh, you may have a word limit sometimes of, you know, 250 words only, where you have to be very crisp and concise to, you know, just share what are your goals, why you're interested in this particular program. And, you know, that is very tense. So that maybe in during those SOPs, you may want to, you know, kind of make it more concise or, you know, create a more summary of the common draft that you have created of 1000 words. But what I've observed is generally it is 500 to 750 words around so 500 or 750, 1000 words. It's very less. Uh, most of the universities stick to 750 words. Um, coming to the next slide uh, is the resume and additional essays. So SOP, you do have a word limit of 1000 words, but it has to be very be personalized. So you'll be not be able to share each and everything that you have done during the course of your academics or even your work. So resume, it's important to have a good resume where you're giving an overview of your profile in bullet points and you know, uh, keep it simple, com compile it in an ATS friendly manner, just like you do when you're applying to jobs. Take support of the placement cell seniors in vetting your resume and use action verbs. And also always highlight your achievements rather than just mentioning routine tasks, because what they will also want to see in resume is that if you delivered something, what impact has your contribution done saying that, you know, you are doing this data analysis, this EDA, I was performing this task, I made this data pipeline, but what happened because of that is more important than just mentioning what you are doing. And nowadays, from the past two years, additional essays have also started gaining an important weightage in applications. You don't many times have only one single SOP. You may also have additional optional essays. You know, like there can be a diversity and inclusion essay, essay where they'll give you a statement that, okay, if you are coming to this university, how will you be able to contribute to the DEI policies of the university? Or, you know, there, there is also, there are, I've also seen programming essay. For example, in Northwestern, we had programming essay also. So, you know, you are asked to describe one project where you came across a certain problem, more of like a star format. What was the situation? How did you go about it? And what was the result? So you give a 250 word essay for that. Then you also have video essays now is where you have to you know it may be either a planned video where you are given questions to select from or it can be impromptu videos so a question will get uh, flashed in front of you in the screen and you'll be given one minute to prepare and one minute to answer so these additional essays are optional in the application process few universities also have it as compulsory but I would still highly recommend that you submit all optional essays along with the SOP because it will increase your chances of admit. 
people uh, you know if if there is another student who has a similar profile to you has similar test scores like you if you are given the option essay that also gives a sense that you are really committed to you know this university you are highly interested in this university and want to study there so that is all what i wanted to add add regarding the additional essays so finally, coming to the applying to universities, these are just certain few pointers or suggestions from my side. If when I think back and connect the dots, what I could have done better or and also from what I've heard from my peers by when they were applying. So create a rank of your university applications, you know, which ones you want to give priority first, because uh, there are also, you know, in certain universities, you may also have a scholarship deadline. Let's say if there is a regular deadline of January 1st, 2025, there can be a scholarship deadline of November 26th, 2024, where if you apply before that deadline, you will be considered for a merit-based scholarship. So accordingly, see the dates and create your rank and apply accordingly and not in any random manner. Um, do not wait till last date of submission deadline. The universities on their page will always say that we consider each and every application important. Yes, they do. But still, it, it is generally first come, first serve. And if you want to increase your chances of admission, I will recommend that you submit at least two to three, four, you know, two to four weeks in advance of the priority or regular deadline, whatever it may be. Or they can also be just one deadline, common deadline. But it is recommended that you submit it because there are the number of applications uh, year on year is increasing. The competition is also increasing and specifically in areas of like computer science, data science, even electronics engineering for that fact. So, or IT. So the competition is high. And if you want to increase your chance, do not wait till the last moment. Be honest about yourself and share info. Do not fabricate any information, any internship experience or any, do not have any fake LOR from someone who you know or maybe a relative. If this gets caught later on, it can also, it can create troubles for you. You know, get like getting not only back, blacklisted from that university, but also other universities with whom this is shared. And like, for example, this is a suggestion from my side where I kept an accountability partner like my uh, mother who just you kind of reminded me, okay, you have this application deadline. So you don't fall under that, you know, procrastination loop because it does sometimes does feel overwhelming at times because you have to, you know, collect so much uh, LORs from different professors, coordinate with them, work with them, and also create separate unique SOPs for every university and on top of that also give the optional essays so better start you know early and finish it off than rather than you know panicking at the last moment and also specifically regarding LOS as someone had asked in between the session you ask it from any professor or any office manager give give them time give them at least i would suggest 25 to you know one month or you know 1.5 months at least before your application deadline to let them draft the lor you can uh, if you'll go to them at last moment they may not have time because they also will be giving lors to others and i have i have had heard instances from friends who had asked for a lor from a professor they had promised but due to some unforeseen re reason they were not able to sh give an lor him uh, just before the deadline. So also keep some backup backup options open, and accordingly also when you are you know creating the shortlist, final shortlist, you may have to in, uh, decrease the number of university applications depending on the number of LORs you have. LOR can can become a bottleneck when you are applying because uh, some universities do have two. It will not be less than two but they can have two or mainly three. So if you are considering, let's say eight applications like I did, that means I needed 24 LORs. Now LOR is generally common. So the three LORs that you have, 
you don't need to customize it for every uh, university. But the issue is that that professor or the your peer, professional peer or manager has to, you know, submit from their side. You will not be submitting the LOR in the system. There is a separate request system where you will be giving the email address of your recommender. They will then go and upload the LOR. So for every university, you will be have you will have to provide their contact details, their their email ID, and sometimes professors also have a limit in the number of universities they will be and choose wisely which professors you want to approach to or which professional your office manager is how many number of uh, uh, you know applications they are willing to give recommendations for finally coming to the admit tracker kind of like where if you have received admits so the general wait time for admits is six to eight weeks if you have given in priority deadline it can go down they may give you early decisions also and some some universities have rolling basis admits. Uh, they can review both priority or, or or they can review both priority and regular deadlines. You know, like Columbia, NYU, I have heard. Uh, and once you get your admits, if you have, let's say, more than one, which I would generally hope for everyone who is attending this session today, you will have more than one admit. Always also then comes uh, it comes down to, you know, selecting certain factors that you prefer, you know, brand name of the university, the location, what are the job prospects there, the weather, your budget, or even class size at times can matter. It is very huge batch size. And there's other university where you will get a personalized or, you know, kind of approach where you will get more attention from professors. You may also want that becomes an important factor. Also, what are the different kind of electives or specializations if there are any, if what kind of options are there in each university and also the number of credits. So the number of credits are generally 30 to 36 if it's a semester based and quarter, there are also certain universities like Northwestern has a quarter credit system. So your number of credits will increase, but overall it is equivalent to semester system and also your duration of program. If you have, let's say, a nine month or one year program versus a two year program, which one are you interested to go for? That is also an important factor you should consider. And in case of rejections, generally, most universities will not give you a reason. They'll just uh, provide a standard response that thank you for applying. But because so many deserving candidates were there, you were not selected and we hope Best of luck for you. And even if you ask or email them, most of the times they do not reply. So, and also uh, this is a suggestion, a general suggestion that I have also heard that if you're, let's say, applying it second time, if in one year you did not, unfortunately did not get any admission from an university or you did not get admissions to your choice of university, avoid applying to rejected universities because that can also be be a factor that the admissions committee can you know take in consideration when going through your application because they will have history or record of which student has applied or whether the first time was or they have applied the second time as well. and uh, last this is very beyond, uh, way far in the future but next year hopefully you guys will be going through this process in you know around between May to July, where you will have your visa application. So you'll be finalizing one university where you'll you know, pay, the, pay the tuition deposit if there is, you'll request for the I-20, you get it from them. And uh, you have to provide the financial proof or funding proof that you are able to pay for, you know, so and so period of time. And then you receive the I-20 once you get that, you know, these are generally the five general uh, steps where you fill the DS-160 form, you have you pay the visa fees, you pay the service fee for that university, and uh, then you select your biometric and visa dates. And visa dates generally open in bulk slots, so and that dates are never declared by the uh, U.S. consulate in advance. So do not worry; they have always they give minimum one chance to each and every student who is applying. 
so many a times people do panic and you know think that oh i may not receive a uh, you know interview date but generally they keep good amount of slots in the period of june july and even august if your program is you know let's say starting in september and then you finally you attend the visa interview visa interview is generally straightforward and it is mainly generic questions of you know what was your undergrad what was your cgpa why are you interested in going to this university or what is your funding proof and it generally tends to be one to two minutes not more than that and you then get approved and you can always go to youtube and there are a lot of good videos where they will give you tips and common questions what are generally asked and with that thank you and good luck and i'll now be opening it for questions adarshan okay uh, thank you mr shashwat for this uh, very uh, great session so i have i have been seeing lots of questions pouring from audience so i will be selecting few and trying to answer uh, more to come so yeah sure. uh, you already did mention this actually but uh, if you could reiterate uh, Take a stu uh, student named uh, Mr. Who is the boss? Okay, uh, has asked, uh, can we use a medium of instruction certificate instead of uh, taking Duolingo, IELTS, or TOEFL? And uh, so medium. And, uh, yeah, please complete. And does I IITM and uh, issue MOI certificate for BA students? Uh, that two question I don't think will be MOI certificate. I'm not aware, but if we if we if his or her question is regarding the uh, English proficiency, then yeah, uh, English proficiency, as I mentioned, if you have in the transcript, like for IIT Madras, I had submitted in the transcript, it is mentioned in the end that this program was deliver is delivered is in English medium sufficient to you know provide as a proof. Okay, uh, Keshav has asked, uh, will gate uh, gate exam be helpful for foreign universities? Uh, unfortunately, gate exam is only for Indian universities. For masters, you or will be required to give uh, either GRE or GMAT. Okay, K. Senthur Kumaran has also raised hand. So, would you like to ask something? Uh, hi, this is Senthur here. Uh, I'm actually, uh, I just have a small query. So, I'm a third year student at VIT at CNC, CAC department. Uh, so, I've gone through the entire session. I just have a small sir, doubt, sir. Uh, consider I've done around four research papers till now. I'll be finishing by this month. So apart from research papers and good projects, what more does the university expect? Like, is there something that you have to have decoded, right? Suppose say Northwestern University, I have kept that as my ambitious one. And apart from these two factors and a good CGPA, what more other than IIT Madras degree too? What more is needed? Oh, I think you are good to go. You have four research papers. If they are published well and good, that actually adds to the weightage in your application. But okay. if you're a third year um, and you plan to do any internship or are doing any internship, I have completely add. So yeah, awesome. So that also adds. So good luck. Start your preparations and start applying. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Vedant, you want to go ahead? Ask. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, one of your university rejects was UCSD, right? And the thing is, uh, I, I come from a three-year bachelor degree in statistics. So uh, I have naturally uh, uh, very few universities that accept my degree. So UCSD is one of them, and I'm uh, like very keen to go there. So I have an A plus CGP, a research paper, this this degree as well. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to ask what uh, happened with UCSD because I'm really hoping to go there. So you says the I also do not have an answer for why I received and reject, but uh, UCSD is competitive nonetheless. It was my ambitious university. Um, um, what I can say is that people actually apply quite well in advance. So you know why that is why the pointer I shared because in UC UCSD I thought that you know I have a later deadline. I I will apply two weeks before, but 
what I later heard from other students where the uh, peers was that uh, they had applied, you know, uh, just as the application started. So the application for UCSD starts in September only. So you can submit your application entirely in September and wait for the decision till February. And that can increase your chances. That generally increases your chances. So because people are more mainly on the same level, your CGPA can be same, but you know, it's, it can mostly it's observed it's first come first serve and you know as see it start filling your chances can reduce right, but right. Uh, uh, coming to your point coming to your point yeah definitely you do have the disadvantage of having only three year you know uh, degree program but since you are part of iit madras program i assume you might as well take advantage complete the four years here and then show it uh, as you know having that minimum requirement of having a four de four year degree program um, right, so right that right. would be one suggestion yeah. yeah another question i had was uh, regarding scholarships at northwestern because northwestern is a very uh, costly university like right? uh, at par with the ivy leagues as well right so i just wanted to ask what ta or uh, research assistantships uh, provide scholarships there so it varies university to university and also scholarships uh, nowadays, um, in these programs of you know tech oriented masters, um, the chances of getting a scholar scholarship in the past two years has decreased drastically. So and uh, apart from that, TARA, uh, any uh, even students that are incoming first six months, it becomes difficult to land a TARA. I, even I am just going in the program, so I am also yet to discover. But from what I've heard from my seniors, uh, you do need a, you know, you can go start applying, but it may take three to four months or even one semester or one quarter before you land a TARA position because professors generally also do want to see your performance in their courses. If you want to work with a professor, they will also want to see beforehand, okay, if this student is you know, performing well in grades and also you know, contributing much more to the program in the or the course and has a very high interest. That is when you kind of build a rapo and then you get a TARA and it's not like job where you apply and you can get because TARA is more personalized in approach where you are wanting to connect with the professor and work with them. So it takes time and effort or, you know, building that relationship. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Okay, a student named uh, DH has uh, asked question in the comment. So uh, he asked question uh, first of uh, regarding uh, can the LOR from school, like uh, from the school principal, be acceptable? In uh, this uh... School, school principal as in tenth twelfth, wala. Uh, maybe yeah, he is suggesting hinting that way. Ah uh, no no, <laughs> stick to undergrad. Stick to undergrad or if you have done a post degree, whatever anything which is. Uh, above 12 standard because that does not have any weightage and that will not be accepted because uh, it is expected since you have completed a four-year degree or are doing a four-year degree you have a good repo with professors in your program and not something you have done in past okay i think uh, uh, rdh was hinting towards our undergrad studies uh, in this case because uh he has mentioned here that uh He's joining his first year class, uh, engineering class. Is there any possibility for him studying abroad from second year? I, uh, but then this would not be a master's program. I guess this deviates yeah, from yeah. what we are currently yeah. discussing. Yeah. 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 So Ayush, uh, uh, if he's uh, applying for UG course, as someone has pointed out. Uh, then that is a different process and unfortunately I'm not aware of you know of that SAT process how it works so yeah okay no issue are you sure you have raised your hand please go ahead uh, yes sir hi uh, I just wanted hi. to know um, is a four-year degree absolutely necessary for starting to apply to foreign universities and my second question is how important is job experience in relation to all this Okay, so first question, uh, yeah, as I previously previously said, uh, yeah, it does unfortunately have the weightages there on four-year programs from India specifically. 
and uh, you you may be at a disadvantage but it is always a good if you know send us just to send a general email to the uh, you know the university you are interested in and ask them if they are planning to waive this off in the next in the upcoming you know application round because every year policies get updated in the by the team admission team and you know sometimes in the future if they are planning to do so they can share it with you that they are they are willing to accept students who are applying with only a three year degree pro a uh, three year degree program. So yeah, and and for your uh, second point, uh, no, what was the second question? Pardon. Uh, so I asked uh, how important is uh, job experience? I mean, are, uh, work experience, are people yeah, job the... experience, yeah. So I am currently also going with three years of experience. And uh, even if you're going right out after undergrad, uh, currently the job market globally has been impacted. So there are, there are certain people are observing that it's becoming harder and harder to land a job uh, right after, you know, coming after the master's program without having any professional experience. So I, I would recommend have take one to two years of work experience if possible. But if you are highly interested in masters or are planning to do a research oriented masters, or rather than, rather than a professional masters program where you don't want to go just for job or you're planning to do a PhD further, then you may want to do think of Directly applying, yeah. but it will be subjective and uh, case to case. Okay. Um, all right, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, Adya, uh, Adya, and Ash, yours yeah. will be the last question. Uh, Adya, please go ahead. Um, good evening, sir. So, I have two questions. Hi. First was regarding uh, the return on investment that we can expect after pursuing our masters from abroad. And second question was related to what prospect, what career prospect can we expect after pursuing masters from abroad? So ROI is also something very subjective. Um, your ROI, if you can, it is better to calculate it in long term, you know, 10 to 15 years. Uh, you are going with an intent, you know, of developing your skill sets to a point where you are, are, you know, able to get a much better job or, you know, much better position in the market there because the market there is much ahead in terms of, you know, both tech, technology, skill sets, and also demand, market demand. So that is the reason why people are going for masters. ROI, if you are concerned, then you should, you know, definitely check out public universities which have low uh, tuition cost and accordingly check out for the uh, their, how many students are landing placement records. Check for, the, check for the placement records. Universities in US do put out their record of how which students, where which are the companies they are landing jobs in, what, where are they getting internships and what is the average salary package. So that will give you a good view of, you know, being able to calculate that if I'm investing $50,000, let's say. Uh, will I be able to, with this university prestige or this program uh, importance uh, and the, even the location of the university, can I will, be, will I be able to land, you know, let's say 100K job, then that's a good ROI if it's double. So, yeah, I'm just giving a very rough uh, hypothetical value, but yeah, that is how you can proceed. And even job prospects uh, after master's, it depends on your program. So this is also a very important point to consider that if you are going for business analytics or data science or even computer science, the Homeland Security in US defines that what kind of jobs you can do after your master's. So it is like if you're going for a data science uh, program, but then you say that I want to take up a job of a project manager or a supply chain expert, for example, which does not require any data science knowledge, then you may not be allowed to take up such kind of jobs which are outside your domain of expertise. So it is always good that you do the research, 
uh, of the job market in us and i'll be sharing the two links which i had mentioned earlier of the ncsu it will give, give you a good generic idea of you know what are the hotspots for the data data related jobs in us and also the list of the universities who have these programs so hope that answers and helps you all Thank the best you, Yeah, I posted the links in the chat for everyone. Yeah. Adarsham, any last questions? You're speaking on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ayesha, would you yeah. like to go ahead or... Uh... Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I had a question uh, related to um, the prerequisites uh, for data science uh, and machine learning masters abroad. So um, while like checking out their websites and all, most of the universities uh, have a prerequisite. Like you need to have... Um, uh, some courses from CS or something uh, in your academic transcript. And uh, coming from a non-CS uh, background, uh, EC background, how hard will it be uh, for me to apply to universities under um, this data science master's, considering I'm doing the IIT program? If you're currently doing IIT program, it will definitely give you, uh, you know, good great advantage for you know covering up your having a non cs background just like me and that is how i also you know projected that i have iit madras degree of data, focusing on data science that definitely helped in me help me in my applications but yeah um some universities are very strict and hence i also had to drop out one to two universities where i was interested to apply but was not able to so if you know if they're very uh, you know sure that they want you to have OOP uh, related courses taken during your undergrad and you do not have that, then that can be a roadblock for you. And yeah, definitely prerequisite, but general prerequisites that I have observed till now, it's mainly, you know, having experience of linear algebra, calculus, and uh, that is mostly what it tends to, or even prop stats, which I think in first year engineering, most of us do. Even in IIT Madras in foundation, we have gone through these courses very well. And uh, even in the BS program, I guess in the electives you would have taken, you then you can also, if you are if you are planning to apply to universities, whether, you know, giving more weightage in prerequisites on, you know, DSA or OOP, although it is a data science pro, uh, program, but I feel that uh, it's mainly, it can, these programs where they have this DSA and OOPS requirement prereq are generally departments uh, or, you know, is the CS department. But if it's a separate department, data science department in that university, or let's say uh, uh, arts, science, science, and arts department. So there are different department, departments in every university, right? So I what I have seen when applying is that CS universities, sometimes CS departments of certain universities have a very specific ask that you know they want experience you know students to have taken a dsa course or a oops course or even computer architecture for that matter so yeah that can limit your choices but um, you will definitely be able to finalize 8 to 10 university even with a ec background just like myself okay thank you thank you yeah thank you. Okay, I think uh, we have already uh, over extended ourselves over the designated time. So I think it would be better to just conclude this session. So once again, like I would like to thank uh, Mr. Saswat for a very enlightening presentation. It was like very uh, informative and a student who is aspiring uh, for uh, foreign universities and uh, pursuing masters. This was very helpful for me too. And uh, also I would like to thank the audience for uh, uh, being engaged and asking their questions out loud. Uh, finally, I would like to thank IIC team for conducting this session and SPC for facilitating it. So thank you everyone. Thank you once again, Mr. Shashwat. Yeah.
thank you thank you everyone who came for the session hope it helps all the best hello